As much as I want Mobius to be in Genshin Impact, I don't think she will be. Well, if she does end up in Genshin, I at least think that she won't be in such a high position. But in the slight doubt that she might not be the Dendro Archon, I can tell you who else would stand a chance of becoming one. Obviously, I'll be pulling it off of their previous game, Honkai Impact, and tell you all about why they would or would not be the Dendro Archon. Here's three theories about Kusanali and who the Dendro Archon will be. Okay, starting with the obvious answer, Mobius. Now Mobius' features and why she would be the Dendro Archon is pretty obvious. She's green. As cool as it may be, I really don't think Mobius to be the Dendro Archon. Of course, Mihoyo could just make her a Dendro Archon because, well, they can. But other than being green, she does look like she could take on Kusanali's personality. However, the recent events in Sumeru contradict each other so much. The current Dendro Archon is still very young, technically speaking. And the people of Sumeru adore their new god because of that. So much so that an endearing feeling between the people of Sumeru and their newfound Dendro Archon. From her innocent and still indecisive nature, she's even more adored because of that. And even celebrate her birth, giving her the title, The Lesser Lord Usanali. Now quite the opposite, Dr. Mobius is quite the intelligent and knowledgeable scientist who also looks very young. But uses her appearance to persuade others to benefit from her years of studying and manipulation. And Mobius Mobius pursues the infinite possibilities to defeat Honkai, while the Dendro Archon theoretically pursues infinite knowledge and, in my eyes, maybe defeat Celestia. Mobius is also called the Infinity Ouroboros, signifying an endless cycle of death and rebirth, which also ties in well with the theme of Dendro. One odd thing out of Mobius is that she is very cunning compared to the Lesser Lord Usanali, but she does pack quite a twist when it comes down to spicing up the story, which might be the possible plotline behind the true nature of the Dendro Archon, and that the recent change in policies in Sumeru might be according to her plan all along. That being, allowing the pursuit of truth and knowledge with push for folly, meaning the scholars can pursue knowledge or research even if such is from superstition and passed on gossip and rumors, which is a radical change in the standard formula of engaging in studies and theses. Theses? You can't base your studies solely on sayings and rumors alone, because it lacks first-hand or at the very least, a credible second-hand experience or confrontation. The other is permitting uninhibited erudition, which is far more grim than you might think. Well, Aru, that just means that they can do research however they want, right? How bad is that? Well, to me, the best example is probably Full Metal Alchemist. Particularly, the use of humans as an ingredient for the sake of someone's research. Or in more apparent results, to obtain a Philosopher's Stone. That's just an example, I don't think they are actually after the Philosopher's Stone, but they might be. Think about it. If humans are allowed in such experiments, then what isn't? And if we can make experiments based on rumors and gossip, then how is the pursuit of knowledge factual and tangible? Or even worse, to what extent would those rumors be worth researching? And in conjunction, to what end would these quote-unquote scholars need to go for the sake of their research? Is it until all experiments are presumed failure? Or until everything is reduced to ashes? Those decisions really blur the lines between what is and isn't, and especially what should and should not be done. And if we follow the path using Mobius' personality and motives, this could either just be the indecision of a new and inexperienced Archon, or is an underhanded ploy to hide something more sinister within the land of wisdom. In short, Mobius has the simplest yet most apparent visual similarity, and quite frankly, she has this in the bag if this is in fact the main problem in Sumeru. So she holds some ground to be the Dendro Archon story-wise, and regarding appearance, well, she's green. And she is also very uncanny to the Dendro Archon's description, specifically to that of the Lesser Lord Usanali. As for her unlikely personality and its contextual similarity, we can only theorize that the Dendro Archon is the old Dendro Archon disguised as the new one. If not, then she's a new Dendro Archon who is just way too smart even though she's that young and is now acting innocent, making mistakes here and there, and is pretending to be very indecisive to further the progress of Sumeru. In the guise that she is either planning something or is trying to hide something that led to her decision to push for folly and, well, the possible sanction of reckless abandon for the sake of acquiring knowledge. Knowledge. 
Now this isn't really far from what might happen, but the main problem here is that why the god of wisdom herself would allow for such a radical and counterintuitive move for its region? Would the thing she is hiding be that much of a threat to the people of Sumeru that the blind pursuit of superstition and hearsay, as well as the loss for rooted knowledge, would be better off undiscovered? What's more is that she has the people's adoration to such a degree that they wouldn't mind a radical decision. I mean, it does add up if you're a scholar looking for more ways to improve your research. But to me, everything happening is just because of the new Archon's indecisiveness. And what's being hidden by the Dendro Archon is too much of a problem to still be left unchecked, which also doesn't add up. Another thing is that Mobius' aesthetic is very similar to that of a snake not a vine or a tree branch. However, the Ouroboros symbolizes rebirth, transformation, and immortality as well as healing, which is what Dendro does. It heals, which is fine and dandy, but immortality was already glossed over by our recent events back in Inazuma. Heck, immortality shouldn't even be a problem for Archons because, well, they were already gods even before becoming Archons. But of course, this is just all part of the Genshin storyline, which is kind of bugging me because the problems don't solve themselves or at least move in some fashion up until we get there. But everything else after what I said is up to you to believe or not, as well as elaborate on. This lady right here is named Ji Shuan Yuan. Oof, that's a mouthful, I know. She's one of the stigmatas in the previous game, Honkai Impact. And she doesn't have much story that can be related to Dendro. If any, she's the most wild card character out there. But the fact that her visual just screams the land of Dendro is something worth looking into. And her name isn't so far from Sumeru names we've heard so far. Maybe shortening it to Shun Yuan or Ji Yuan would make it sound a bit easier to speak of. But for now, I'll call her Yuan to keep my video from running over 20 minutes. A quick backstory on Yuan is that she is the daughter of a great ruler and that she was given a sword right before running away as a monster was terrorizing her kingdom. After running aimlessly, she was tired and then suddenly activated the sword. And then a strange mark appeared on her body and gave her power to wield the sword's magical power. She was able to change elements with the orb on her sword, and then later made a new empire with her new title, Wangdi, meaning the Yellow Emperor. Other than that, she also has a dark or corrupted form. The story goes where it was the result of sacrificing herself to hold another monster under the sea. And part of her soul was left inside it, but apparently her body was still alive and conscious and was left alone with the sword for a very long time, like thousands of years alone. Hence the corrupted form, Dark Mode Yuan. <clears throat> Whether or not this dark version of herself is included, uh, probably, maybe not. We won't know until we get to Sumeru. Now, I find her reference to the real-life Chinese Yellow Emperor very interesting because the map of Teyvat looks a lot like the map of the ancient tribal China. Now, I'm sorry if I couldn't find any IRL referencing for Mobius, but I just could not find any. Especially since what I find has to be related somehow to Genshin Impact, the Dendro Archon herself, and Sumeru in terms of context. So to me, this screams a lot of originality and referencing to real-life lore is very convincing for the story progression within Teyvat. And the fact that Ji Shu... The fact that you won... And the fact that Yuan's aesthetic looks a lot like what Sumeru's Archon would look like. She also has a one-up for being a character with a blank slate. So Mihoyo can pretty much do whatever they want with this storyline. And being a stigmata set or an NPC in Honkai makes Yuan have a lighter feedback when entering Genshin Impact compared to doing a playable character from their previous games. Venti and Zhongli had more of an impression on themselves as an original character than a comparison to Wendy and Fuwa or Adam in Honkai. Now, there's a story about the Yellow Emperor as well as the five great kings and three more kings that stated within the ancient tribal China, but I'll take that into another video. Summarizing all that, even though her contextual relation to Sumeru in Genshin is kinda hard to pin together, Yuan's visual relation and IRL referencing, as well as her blank slate for development and creative freedom, make her a very likely candidate for being the Dendro Archon. But the problem that would come up here is that even though she is a Dendro Archon, which would undoubtedly be a must-pull or an essential member in your team, majority of the time at least, it might not pull as much as Raiden would since she's one of the main characters from the previous games. And dare I say, her model would be a younger person compared to what Raiden was. 
Keep in mind, Rydens is the first tall female model of all the Archons. But in hindsight, her description being the youngest of the seven Archons is already a hint to anyone waiting for her. She also has much less hype than that of a main character. Add to that the huge excitement and anticipation that Mobius already has, even though she has the best creative freedom, she's still on an uphill battle because most, if not all, known content creators and players already have their eyes on Mobius. But I'll let you guys decide which one has a better chance. Lastly, to keep you guys watching the video, the word dendro does not have to be about wood, or trees, or maybe even vines. Keep in mind that the word dendro is a general name for the element and it can take on various forms depending on its user. And one form of dendro is of course plants. And of plants, we also have flowers. Now this theory is more about finding the closest possible candidate in terms of previous lore, and fitting as much of the Dendro Archon's description instead of visual relation alone. So green isn't the only answer. The previous Dendro Archon, named God of the Woods, which is brown, died 500 years ago in the Cataclysm. Which is a shame, I know, we don't get to see wood jutsu in the next region, but it is what it is. So after the God of the Woods died 500 years ago, he or she was then replaced by someone called the Lesser Lord Usanali in as early as her birth, translating to the Chinese term Lucky Little Grass King. So here we have a form of dendro that isn't just trees and vines. We also have grass. Not only that, there's also a festival in Sumeru called the Subzerus Festival. I hope I didn't butcher that. Commemorating Kusanali's birth, which if translated to Korean, Chinese, and Japanese, means flower god's birthday. Now in all my days playing Honkai Impact, there was never a flower god or grass herscher. Even the word flower herscher cannot be found or at least be related. The only possible correlation is a flower visual ability or a representation on their aesthetic design. Compared to Mobius, whose green and sneaky snake personality hides the secret of wisdom, another character we can take into consideration is the young girl named Sele Volari and Veliona. Yes, I mentioned two people, but they are one and the same inside a single body. In Honkai's lore, Sele developed an insecurity that made Veliona emerge with the latent power of a true stigmata. A short description for stigmatas are curse marks which are mutations that form in the body of the host, allowing the adaptability of an alien power, or in the game's context, Honkai power. Quite similar to the mark that you won, the previous example that I stated, it emerged on her body after activating the sword. This mark would then become somewhat her imaginary friend and sneaks around as a weird shadow, often goading her resolve and even intervening when things get a little sour. That's because Veliona is a stigmata capable of unlocking Sele's Hersher power and can only be unleashed if allowed by Sele herself. Spoiler warning, she did unlock her Hersher power, and would then be tied to Veliona even more than just a shadow. Instead, two different souls now share the same body, and they swap turns for that body whenever they need to. However, the young and indecisive Sele is still quite the same Sele even after gaining her powers, so her personality still stands. And along with that, so would Veliona's personality. <clears throat> for the sake of story making and creative theorizing, I'm gonna let myself off on this for a bit. Since the Lesser Lord Kusanali became an Archon after her birth or maybe even after a few years from her birth, she wouldn't be able to make decisions, let alone decide the fate of her country alone. She has sages that also make decisions with her. My take here is that Sumeru has a somewhat of a more federal rule compared to other countries. It is possible that one of the sages, which we can name Veliona, was the one who petitioned and then eventually was able to sanction the decrees that are now being done within Sumeru. And Sele being the still young and indecisive new Archon, Veliona only has to goad her and make her say yes. Albeit reluctant to most and wouldn't allow much of what has been done, since she is the youngest Archon ever, you'd think that some people in relative power would undermine that all too apparent weakness, right? We can also assume that Veliona is one and the same with Sele if she isn't one of the sages and that she persuades Sele to her ways within Sele's mind. But all that said, she wouldn't lead Sele to her own demise since she wouldn't want her own vessel to fall apart because, well, she's part of it. 
But similar to the story within Honkai, you can say well Oru isn't this just the same as Raiden Shogun's perspective and A within the Raiden Shogun puppet? Well, kinda but no. Think of it this way. Imagine if the Shogun had Scaramouche inside her head messing up her decisions but is unable to leave A's body. If you watch this anime, it would be very similar to this one too. Everything Sele is doing, despite trying her best, is slightly leaning towards, if not completely leaning, towards Veliona's motive in the end. It is also very likely that Mihoyo would use another playable character as one of its Archons, cause well, marketing. And honestly, it would fit why the current situation in Sumeru is as it is. But the problem here now is that Sele has no relation whatsoever to the word dendro or anything related to nature for that matter. She does however have a flower aesthetic on one of her Valkyrie types. But this form of Valkyrie is a lot more connected to Veliona and was achieved when she allowed Veliona to take control of her body. And if you look at it closely, she's quite literally chained along with her. I guess it cements the fact that they can't be separated at all. But other than that, she's the most out of place when it comes to visual representation as well as contextual relation out of all the three. It might be written as Veliona being the previous god of the woods and Sele now has her inside her head to deal with and Veliona could be trying to convince Sele to keep something hidden in Sumeru that's way more dangerous than the madness throughout gaining knowledge. Add to that that there hasn't been a two-faced Archon yet, well kinda, so I doubt they'll pull out those cards just yet. Now this is all I can say regarding Sele and Veliona being the Dendro Archon, but I'll leave that theory for you to mull over. And there it is, all that I could mention in regards to who the Lesser Lord Usanali is or who the Dendro Archon will be. For any Honkai players, you are all probably flaming me for including Sele or Astigmata piece as the Dendro Archon, but I couldn't help myself after suddenly having Mobius in my roster and played using her while wondering if she really is the Dendro Archon. Honestly, she makes for a great Two-Face Archon and spices the story plot on whether or not she is to be trusted, as well as Sele and Veliona showing an actual Two-Faced person with, well, two people inside of one body, but I'm betting my primos on Yuan as the new Archon. Her whole design and lack of backstory is worth making into a proper character in another game. And having Dark Mode Yuan is also a great reason for spicing up the plot. So that's gonna be it for this video. I'll be making a different video that isn't about Sumeru. Bruh. Maybe. If you have any other characters that you'd want to mention, or any possible theory for characters that might be taken in as the Dendro Archon, or if I missed something in this video, do tell me down in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel, as well as clicking the bell icon to stay updated to my content. I'll see you guys later. Bye!